All right. Uh, thanks very much, Ayal, for that introduction. And thank you for the committee to in for inviting me. So um, indeed, the previous uh, talk is the perfect uh, introduction to uh, lead to the topic that I'll be talking about. Um, however, I also want to let you uh, reassure you, just in case some of you did not f become experts on multilinear maps based on Sanjum's excellent talk, most of this talk should still be uh, very understandable to you. All right, and of course, uh, as has been said before, this is supposed to be a fun thing, so please interrupt and ask uh, as many questions as, uh, uh, as you'd like. All right, so suppose that you have a secret. Okay, uh, Most of us have secrets. Um, but unfortunately for you, you have an adversary. And even more unfortunately for you, this adversary has actually captured your entire brain. Okay? And not only has he captured your entire brain, he's able to read and tamper with every single neuron within your brain, understand the entire structure of all the neurons in your brain, and in fact, he can do this while you are thinking about the secret that you want to protect. Right? So this sounds pretty horrible, right? Of course, there's some slight physical discomfort that might be involved here. <laughs> but you know, putting that aside, um, more fundamentally, you know, there is this inner sanctuary of our mind right? that we all rely on. And to have that violated, would be, uh, it's a horror story. This is like a horror novel, right? Uh, this would just be pretty terrible. Um, luckily for us, this does remain uh, science fiction. Um, I'm not here to talk to you about uh, capturing people's brains. Um, but if you think about it, the computer science analog of this situation happens all the time, right? The computer science analog of this is that you have your brain, which is some software. Right, that is running on some computer. And that software is completely captured by an adversary. Right? In fact, most use models for software just assume this, that an adversary will get access to your software because you're releasing it or you're selling it. Even in cases where that's not part of the use model, insiders or malwares typically come and find their way to get a hold of your software. Right? So, this sort of horror story for humans um, happens to poor computer programs all the time. Right? And we're here to protect the computer programs. So what we would like to do is ask the question, you know, can a computer program keep a secret even if the adversary captures that entire program? Okay? And I want to stress that we're in a situation here with no trusted hardware, no interaction among different parties. We just have an ordinary computer program right, with ordinary inputs and outputs, not encrypted inputs and encrypted outputs, nothing like that, just ordinary inputs and outputs, where the program is making use of some secret right, to compute its input-output behavior. But the inputs and outputs themselves are not special in any way. Right? And uh, <coughs> it's, again, just running on a single ordinary computer. That is a computer who, that is entirely public. Everyone knows the construction of this computer. The initial state of this computer is also completely public. There's nothing secret about it. Right? OK. So that's what we would like to study here. Uh, before we go to that, let's just uh, step back for a moment and think about earlier concepts uh, that the vast majority of you know and love. And, uh, you know, we're talking about secure multi-party computation, introduced by Yao, Goldrak, McCauley, and Wigderson, then Or Goldwasser, Wigderson, and you know, many beautiful, beautiful works over the last many decades. Now, usually when we talk about secure multi-party computation, you know, we think about multiple parties that are talking to each other, as the name suggests. But I want you to think about it a little bit differently. Let's take a look at the notion of secure multi-party computation through the lens of the mind-reading mind -reading adversary. right? So think about our brain, which is per performing some computation. And now in the secure multi-party setting, what we're thinking of is that we take this brain and just subdivide it right, into little parts of the brain. 
So the brain, little parts can think within that part. It can also communicate with other parts um, of the brain, right? And then what secure multi-party computation asks is, what if an adversary can come and see what's going on in, for example, one of these parts of the brain, right? And can read and tamper with and you know, take over that one part of your brain, right? Can we still have security? And indeed, in the most uh, <coughs> aggressive setting, in the case of n minus 1 corruptions, right, we have a situation where an adversary can corrupt all but one of these subdivisions right, of the brain. And we would still like to argue uh, that there's security. Right? And we have been able to do this for, for decades now. Um, where the main, s oh, sorry, before I say that. Um, but, but again, what's critical here, what's critical in the setting of secure multi-party computation is that there's always at least one honest party, right? That there is one part of this brain that is completely blocked from the adversary. The adversary has no idea what computation is taking place there. He can't tamper with it. He can't do anything to it, right? And this is really the key point in secure multi-party computation. And this leads to the main solution idea right, that we've developed over the last many decades, right, which is, in some sense, to take the computation and kind of spread it out you know, in some way throughout this whole uh, brain using secret sharing. Right? And in that way, as long as the adversary misses at least some one part of the computation, then he's missed the essential of every part of that comp computation. Right? So, um, so that's what we've been looking at before. Uh, these kinds of models have been generalized. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at this idea of a leakage-resilient compiler, right, that takes this idea um, of your full computation, um, <clears throat> where now uh, it's not necessarily subdivided in any particular way, but that there's some leakage going on, uh, some, somebody squeezing this brain and getting some information out of it, um, subject to various conditions that I'm not going to go into. They're not relevant to this talk. Um, but again, it's critical that the leakage is always strictly less than one, right? that you don't actually get all the information. That was, again, the main idea in uh, the work on leakage-resilient uh, uh, cryptography. Um, so the, com you know, the common thread, if you look at these previous uh, works, is that there's some portion right, of this computation that's completely hidden from the adversary. And that's really where the fundamental break is. Right? When we're looking at obfuscation, there is no part of the computation that's hidden. And so here, you know, just spreading out the computation can't, can't help you, right? Because the adversary can follow you down everywhere, in every nook and cranny of the computation, and figure out everything that's going on, right? So, um, so that's the, the fundamental challenge that we're going to be dealing with. All right. So, um, great. So we would like to hide, program, hide secrets in programs, right? Um, another difference with the secure computation setting is that this is not as straightforward a question as, uh, uh, as perhaps it was in the context of secure computation protocols, because it's not the, every program that can even hide a secret. Just as a trivial example, suppose that we have a program that has some constant uh, built into it, some constant s, and the program just takes an input x, checks if it's less than s, if so, outputs 1, otherwise it outputs 0. Right? And perhaps someone would like to uh, keep this constant secret, right? This is the Yao's millionaire problem, right? This is actually a very well-motivated program. But it's obviously hopeless, right? If I take this program, if, as long as I maintain uh, its functionality, there's no hope of hiding this uh, constant s, because I can just do binary search and uh, find the secret in that way, right? So. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so certainly not every program, even interesting programs, are even amenable to the possibility of hiding secrets within them. Um, and for secrecy to be plausible at all, uh, we definitely need that the program should be unlearnable with queries, right? That the, that the secret, especially, that we're trying to hide should not be learnable just by making input-output queries to the program, right? Um, and this leads to a natural hope that we could try to define our notion of 
uh, uh, obfuscation to only allow what you can learn with queries, right? So just to uh, do this idea of a virtual black box that I take my program, I obfuscate it, and what I end up with is something that is just as useful um, as just having input-output access to that program, right? Very natural. Um, so uh, this worked for a few seconds right now. Um, but you know, so what happened was uh, back in 2001, uh, this idea was formalized um, in, in our work, and then we ruled it out. So this was uh, unfortunately too good to be, uh, to, to be true in general. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what do I mean by that? Let me make that very, very precise, because this is an easy result to misinterpret. So we mean something very precise. What we showed is that there exist some very contrived, okay, extremely contrived uh, programs that I'm going to call self-eating programs, for which black box obfuscation would suffer from explicit attacks. So again, the positive thing here is there are actually explicit attacks. We're going to be able to, despite the fact that this program is not one that you can extract a secret out of just with black box access, we're still going to explicitly show you how to get a secret out of it, okay, just by giving any uh, obfuscated version of it. But of course, the bad thing is that it's very, very contrived. And I have never seen an interesting program that behaves in this way, um, except for interesting to us. So what's the idea? Right? The idea is that we're going to make a program <coughs> that takes some input x. Um, it'll have some secret constant inside of it. That's not really that important right now. But what the program does is, informally speaking, it just checks if the input is actually a program that is equivalent to itself. Okay. Now, of course, in general, this is uh, undecidable or, uh, or at least very hard problem. Uh, <coughs> but we designed this program in such a way so that the key property is something that can be checked in this way, right? And if the input happens to be a program that is actually equivalent to P, then it just outputs a secret. Otherwise, it outputs zero, right? And now the point is that if I only have black box access to this program, if I only am giving it as a black box, it just looks like a zero function, right? Anything I could guess and try to feed to it is extremely unlikely to be equivalent to this program P that we've constructed. And therefore, it will just say 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? So if with black box access, you can't hope to learn the secret S. But on the other hand, any obfuscation of this program would allow you to learn the secret trivially, right? Just take the obfuscated version, feed it to itself, and out pops a secret, right? So um, this can be made precise and formal. I won't go into the, uh, the, into the details of that. Um, but again, there's an explicit attack, this one right here. Uh, but it's a pretty a contrived, uh, contrived case. Um, I, I do want to stress that all the negative results we have for obfuscation are of this type. They, they have some sort of pathological component, either with respect to the program itself that you're trying to obfuscate, or with respect to some auxiliary input that you're supposed to give to the adversary together with the program that you're trying to obfuscate, where that itself would be some other obfuscated program. So there are these kinds of um, uh, contrivances that exist uh, <coughs> uh, for all, uh, all the known negative results. Um, so if I wasn't at the Simons Institute for, the Theor for Theoretical Computer Science, um, I might talk about uh, why perhaps in practice it's still reasonable to think about the VBB definition. But we're at the Simons Institute for Theoretical Computer Science, and so this is a theory talk. So I won't explore this idea further. So basically, for us, because we don't get this notion, we cannot get this notion in general, we want to move on and try to look for other definitions. Yeah? So the negative results are all contrived. But the positive results are very small, too, right? What are the positive? There's also not known. For natural classes, we have neither positive nor negative results. Oh, that's a good point. You know, I, didn't, I don't have a slide on that. I, 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 should, have, I should have probably uh, summarized it. Before the recent work, there were very, very small uh, positive results for certain little classes of functions, like uh, Hotex, uh, uh, point function obfuscation, and the random oracle model, 
a little bit more and then point functions. So it's true that things like that. And then yeah. We have neither positive nor negative results for VBB. Right, right. Um, I mean, now we, we can get back to this in, in, in light of the newer results where um, it's not, yeah, I've, OK, so one other thing I want to point out, that this is a contrived program. But in fact, uh, because of very clever, low complexity crypto things, you can actually make such a program in a very low complexity class. A relatively low complexity class, something like TC0, right? So, um, uh, as a result, you cannot hope to get a general positive result, even for very wimpy complexity classes for VBB obfuscation. Um, other special cases certainly remain an active area of, in, of investigation. Uh, yeah? You seem to hint that if this wasn't the theoretical conference, you you have something interesting to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, 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 I don't know what interesting, but uh, no, I mean, I, I've already made the main point here, right? That there are contrived uh, negative examples. It's the same thing that we have for the random oracle model, right? In the random oracle model, we have contrived negative, uh, negative results. On the other hand, we don't seem to have any attacks, right, in the real world with, in situations where the random oracle model is deployed. And uh, we may argue similarly that uh, it makes sense to think about it that way. But we are at the Simons Institute right now, and you know, we're, so, so let, me, let, me, let, me, let me proceed on the theory side. Yes? Just, I, I don't know. So if you think about uh, from, from, from a practical point of view, actually. Yes. If you think about things uh, as uh, either learnable or not learnable in the sense that they are PRF, then this is not contrived at all. This is just, you know, you obfuscate that PRF, right, essentially. No, because again, the, the, the contrivance is this, right? It's the fact that you check and then you spill your guts, right? That's the contrived part. What, what, why would someone on purpose put a trapdoor into their program that asks for a, something essentially equivalent to itself? Like it just, that, that's the part that I'm saying is contrived. But I, think that if, but I think that it follows that if you can uh, obfuscate a PRF, then you can actually obfuscate everything, and therefore... Actually, that's not, that's not, that's not obvious. In, in fact, that's a really interesting question. Um, questions of composability for VB obfuscation are still largely open. So um, that's actually a very interesting area to, to, to think about. That would be an interesting way to hope to get beyond that. Maybe then we could get a negative result without any contrivance, but, but as of right now, we haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. All right. Um, good. So, uh, all right. So we want to move past VBB obfuscation, and uh, actually, in that same paper, we introduced or we we suggested an alternative. Um, really, kind of just you know, writing by analogy. You know, we have all these indistinguishability-based definitions in cryptography. So, you know, we thought, hey, let's just think of a natural indistinguishability style definition for obfuscation. And we went through a bunch that didn't work, but um, this one was a natural one, that, that, uh, which is the following. Okay, so let me just tell you what the definition is. Um, for any program P, uh, the obfuscated version of that program should, be a, should retain the functionality. Right? So for any given input x, the obfuscated version of P on input x should equal P of x. Okay? And <coughs> the time. Uh, uh, incurred by the obfuscated program on any input should be some fixed polynomial in the time uh, incurred by the original program. Okay, so this is just basic stuff. What's the interesting thing? The interesting thing is the actual security definition. And here, we, all we want is if I have two completely equivalent programs, P0 and P1, that is for any input x, P0 of x equals P1 of x. Right? If we have completely equivalent programs of the same size, which I'm going to continue to ignore for most of the stock, um, then it should be true that no polynomial time adversary can distinguish between the obfuscation of P0 and the obfuscation of P1. And I included these here just to make the point that even if the adversary knows which are the two programs in, in the clear, you know, P0 and P1 ahead of time, he still shouldn't be able to tell given the obfuscation, whether it came from P0 or whether it came from P1. Okay. So by same size, yeah. what's the same running time? 
Right. Okay. So um, mostly for this talk, it's better to think about the program just being a circuit. So then the question um, would be, yeah, the same. You know, it should have the same structure in that in that in that sense. Um, when we think about Turing machines, the sort of uh, uh, nice way to think about it is that the output of a Turing machine is the time it took to run on that that input together with its output. In that way, you just fold it into this definition. But yes, obviously, if the running time itself was revealing, then we, we, we can't hope to uh, be faithful to that, right, and still, and still have an obfuscation. All right. Um, and of course, the obfuscator itself, IO here, should be a probabilistic polynomial time algorithm, right? And Tal, you have a question? Yes. You want me to ask you instead of a yeah? <laughs> <laughs> it's more of a sort of philosophical question. What does it mean? Well, the best kind, yeah. What does it mean that P0 and P1 are, are, are different? So P1 is, in fact, an obfuscation of P0. So when I go to obfuscate P0, my first step would be the obfuscation of writing it as P1. And then I'd obfuscate them both in the same way. Well, okay, that's a good point. So let me let me let me first just clarify. Even though both p0 and p1 are given to the distinguisher, the obfuscator only gets one program as input. So the obfuscator only knows p0, and he has to obfuscate it only looking at p0. He can't know that there's a p1, right? So that's one point. Uh, the other point is that uh, p0 and p1. In fact, I mean, as Craig will tell us tomorrow when he gives us many uh, several nice examples of how to use indistinguishability obfuscation, we'll see examples where P0 and P1 are definitely not obfuscated. You know, if you looked at them in the clear, there would be all kinds of secrets popping out at you. But nevertheless, they're equivalent, and therefore you can still exploit this definition. That wasn't, that that wasn't the question? OK, sorry. I was saying, let's say I want to obfuscate P0. My first step would be to write P1. And then I'd obfuscate. Well, how do you know what P1 is? I don't. I'm okay. saying it, it, it was a philosophical question. Philosophical question. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so it's not 100 percent clear to me. Why would you ever be able to distinguish? Because I'm saying they're exactly the same. The programs. What does it mean that they're even different? No. Okay. Good. So that is actually a really excellent question. Okay. So the the point the, is. My quality of questions is improving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, what I mean by that is this, that this definition, certainly when we thought of it back then, we thought it was a useless definition, <laughs> right? Because of the point that you're making, right? That if these two questions, if these two programs, P0 and P1, are functionally equivalent, then what can you hope to do from this, right? And so we'll see the answer to that tomorrow, uh, especially tomorrow. A little bit, maybe I'll also mention today, but... but uh, but 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 it turns out to be surprisingly useful. Um, no, but admit, isn't it yeah. surprisingly useful because the obfuscator is polynomial time? If the obfuscator was absolutely unbounded, then what Tal, Tal is making a very good point. You can just ah, that's a good. So the, in fact, that's my next slide right here. Oh, my next 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 the very next thing. So this might also answer your question. So here's just a curious fact. Okay, usually if p equals np, that's terrible news for us as cryptographers, right? Well. It still it still would be terrible, terrible news for us as cryptographers, but um, but interestingly enough, IOs for IO for circuits would exist unconditionally if p equals np. Why? Because I could just take the circuit. Um, uh, if p equals np, then the hierarchy collapses, which means I can compute minimal uh, versions of a circuit, right? In fact, minimum I can take the lexicographically first circuit that is equivalent to my input C, and just pad it out to the appropriate size. And this would be an indistinguishability obfuscation, which is kind of, I think, what you're saying, right? The point is that what we could do is take the input, they take the program P0, and just find the smallest version of it. And that is an obfuscation, according to the IO definition, right? And in fact, it would work if P equals NP because you could do it efficiently, right? Um, what's that? Lots of good things happen if P equals NP. Lots of good things also happen. Entire crypto on the assumption that P is different. Than yeah. <laughs> this is an excellent point. Yes, yes, yes. We should always look at the the glasses half full. Yes, yes. Yeah. Also, other little things like building nuclear power plants and yeah, you know, other stuff like that. Okay, all right. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, despite the professional consequences, I still would be very happy if p equals np. <laughs> um, all right, so, uh, so what does this mean? Aside from this interesting observation, it also means that IO cannot imply hardness by itself, right? Because it exists if p equals np, so there is no hardness, right? Um, but again, as we'll see tomorrow, IO can be used really uh, quite successfully to leverage hardness. So IO plus one way functions gives you a lot of uh, interesting stuff. Yes? So I understand that IO is very useful, but I don't understand in which way does it hide secrets. Right. And again, um, uh, that we will see mostly uh, in the talk tomorrow by Craig. Um, but I'll give you a very, you want me, I can, what? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Where is Craig? Uh, I'm promising a lot, you know. <laughs> Look, uh, okay. I mean, uh, um, you know what, let, 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 maybe, can I postpone that? And uh, I can give a quick example if you would like, a little, maybe a little bit later. Yeah? No, a philosophical answer to that will, you, just like when, encry when encrypting something, you hide everything by the, by the length, so you say two things that are of the equal length, you cannot distinguish whether you encrypted the first or the second. Here you're hiding everything except the functionality for two, so two things that have the equal functionality, you cannot tell if you... Uh, a, a, good, a good analogy, you know, a, a good analogy would be witness indistinguishability, right? Witness indistinguishability is incredibly useful, right? Even though it doesn't look all that useful, maybe if you look at it at first glance. And it's going to be similar in, in the way that we're able to exploit this. So just a small yeah. technicality. So these, I mean, in the definition, these would be these classes of, of families of programs that you are comparing that are equivalent, right? Yes, yes. These, these should all be parameterized, but because, I mean, if I add all the notation for that, it would just become too cumbersome. That, But absolutely, we're talking about families of circuit ensembles. You know, that's the right way to, to talk about this. All right. Um, so the nice thing about this definition is that there was no impossibility results. Uh, there were no impossibility results known for this definition. Um, but on the other hand, it was open for a long time and kind of useless seeming for a long time. Uh, but then again, uh, the reason why I'm here is that uh, two years ago uh, with Sanjim, who you heard from earlier today, Craig, who you'll hear from tomorrow, Shai, who you heard from uh, <laughs> also yesterday, Mariana, who is also in the audience um, somewhere, um, and uh, Brent. Uh, we, we had the first uh, candidate construction for, um, uh, for this idea of indistinguishability obfuscation based on multilinear maps. And, and I'll talk more about that, of course, in the rest of the talk today. Um, and as I mentioned, it turned out to be surprisingly useful. Um, Again, you'll hear more about that tomorrow. But since we're at the Simons Institute, I'll just mention what the Simons Magazine said. So in the Simons Magazine article, uh, you know, it was hailed as a watershed moment because of all these consequences that, that IO ends up having. So um, all right, so what will I talk about for the rest of, uh, the rest of this tutorial? Um, we want to talk about uh, constructions and security. So that's the purpose of this talk, to talk about how do we actually do this, how do we actually build Obfuscation, and what kinds of security proofs can we uh, can we give? I'll take you to the. Okay. So, are you satisfied then with the answer you got? Yes, yes, we should ask Tal to answer the question since you're yeah. so, so when do people always talk about obfuscation, right? They want to obfuscate games, right? right? So that, that you'd be able to put your game out there and nobody would be able to steal it and so on. So, 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 so yeah. yeah. Exactly right. what I said. So this does not offer you anything that would help. Yeah, indeed, as I said, I mean, it really, there were there was essentially a decade in which uh, no one really thought of, of, of any real applications for this. Uh, we did have one application right at the very beginning, which is kind of cool, but I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, okay, let me try to offer one more little preview of, uh, of, of Craig's talk, right? <laughs> so here's another way to think about it, okay? So the two key technique, right? That we all know and love, you know? Uh, uh, right where you encrypt something, and then you encrypt it again, 
right? So think about a decryption program for that, right? There are two ways you could do it. You could use secret key one, or you could use secret key two. As long as you can somehow ensure that only valid ciphertext would ever be decrypted, which we will, and I think Greg will talk about it. Yeah, OK. Um, <laughs> then these two programs, one that uses secret key one and the other one uses secret key two, are functionally equivalent. Right? They always decrypt every single ciphertext exactly the same way. And yet, by I.O., you wouldn't be able to tell whether you're using the secret key one program or the secret key two program. But as long as I can decrypt them, yeah, yeah I don't care. Exactly. Which exactly. Why do you care? OK, that's a, I mean, th but again, you know, think about the two key thing. Like, why did we care then? It's because of a hybrid argument, right? You were able to, to set it up in, a, in, a, in an appropriate what way. Do you mean the real, the other, the simulator? Exactly. The two. Yeah, so, so there are various dance, hybrid dances that we can, we can engage in that get us there. Please, please, please. Craig is going to answer all your questions. <laughs> Craig, you know. <laughs> you <laughs> All right, but again, today, I mean, right now, I would like to talk to you about constructions and security. How do we get this mythical object? <laughs> this is recursive, you know, I'm a little bit worried about this. Um, um, All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, so how are we going to attack this problem? How are we going to construct these objects? Um, at a super duper high level, uh, the way that the current approaches work is an idea that uh, I'll call structured noise. Okay? The idea is that let's think about this program that we want to obfuscate and somehow take <coughs> excuse me, each component of that program and noise it. Right? in a way that individually looks kind of random. Okay? But magically, we're going to design the structured noise in a way that if the user or the adversary combines the program components the way he's supposed to, according to a normal execution of the program, then at the last possible moment, just before he's about to get his, his, his output, the noise cancels out and the output emerges. Okay? But on the other hand, if the adversary tries to combine these components in any other way or modify them, then that noise will remain there and it will hide what's going on, hide all useful information about what's going on. That's at a really high level, that is the idea that we're going to be exploiting. That's the idea in some sense that was exploited by, in Sanjam's talk and we're going to continue exploiting it here. Okay. This is just a super high level thing. It's okay if you if it doesn't make a lot of sense. Oh, I hope it did. All right. So let's jump straight into it. Let's get right into the, the heart of the matter. Um, let's talk about how to actually obfuscate a program. We're going to be talking about obfuscating matrix branching programs, which I'll define and 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 and, and discuss in just a moment. Okay. And here we're following a present presentation of uh, uh, in a joint work with uh, uh, Boaz. Sanjam, Yael, uh, Omer, somewhere, and uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, <laughs> and me. Okay, so um, we're working with multilinear maps. Um, you guys just uh, had two hours on this, but I'm going to change the notation slightly, so let me just remind you what the situation is that we're going to be working with. Okay, um, so the formal setting that we would like to work with is that we have uh, a universe of 1 up to k. k is kind of the maximum in this situation. Okay? And for every non-empty subset of the set 1 through k, we're going to have a ring g sub s. Okay? And each of these rings is just a copy of the integers modulo some large number n. Okay? And uh, as an example, suppose k equals 2. In that case, my sets are the set containing 1, the set containing 2, and the set containing 1, 2. Right? And each of these rings are just copies of Zn. Okay? And I'll use brackets, to, with, as, as shown here, to talk about an encoding of 2 in this particular ring. I'll just talk, write it as 2 in the ring 1. Okay? 
n is the same for every subset. n is the same for all of them. They, they're isomorphic, and that's very important. And, and in fact, yeah, there 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 are nice, comfortable, normal ring of integers module a large number. Um, now, what can you do with these? What operations do you have? You can add, and addition is restricted to working within one of these rings. So within GS and GS, you can add two things together and get something else in GS. Again, just as an example, if I have 2 and 7, both encoded at level 1, I can add them, and I get 9. On the other hand, addition only works in this case. So what's not allowed is taking an encoding of 2 at level 1 and 7 at level 2 and add them together. These things will not fit together. They will not add. OK? Yes? What's the connection between this notion where you have the subsets and the, and the previous notion where we had the levels? It's just basically what Sanjay was talking about was taking the single, num the single polynomial z, or, or number in the CLT case, and just raising it to a power. Here we'll have z1 up to zk, different polynomials, and you just multiply them all together in the zero testing. So that's the cheat sheet uh, to go with what Tanjim was saying. Okay. All right, so again, we have addition. We can add within the group. We cannot add across groups, uh, across rings. Now, multiplication is different. <coughs> multiplication is if I have g sub s and g sub t, and s and t are disjoint, then I can multiply and go to the union. Okay, so again, as another example, if I have 2 and 3 encoded at levels 1 and 2, I could multiply them and jump to the level 1, 2. Right? On the other hand, if I had two things both at level 1, then it's not allowed because these are not disjoint sets, and therefore you, it just wouldn't work. Okay? Um, and this is exactly what Sanjim was saying, just in a slightly different uh, uh, terminology. Um, and then finally, of course, the real, really important point is that we have the zero test, right? So at the final level, at g corresponding to the set 1 through k, if you have an encoding of an element there, I can go to the zero test and get a yes-no answer, okay? And again, the critical point here is that addition and multiplication took encodings and output, en and output encodings, took encoding, output encodings, right? So everything was still hidden in terms of what was going on. This is the only operation that actually yields the result in the clear, right? And this is what we're going to be exploiting. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions? Yes? So when you have a subset 1, when you're doing multiplication, we can, can't multiply something with a subset 1 by another thing in subset 1? That's right, okay. yes. So the levels are really like horizontal now. It's like 1 through k. And yeah, yeah, that's the right way to think about it. Think about the hypercube <laughs> and, you know, you've got the level. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. All right. So, um, okay. Eventually, we'll get to some computational hardness assumptions, a concrete one over this framework, but, um, uh, uh, but not right now. And um, this framework, I'm thinking about it just as an ideal <coughs> multilinear sort of setting. Uh, everything I'm talking about would you know, make sense, especially in light of the most recent uh, CLT 15 uh, uh, work. Um, one point that I want to stress that Sanjim also mentioned is that in the obfuscation setting, we need only a restricted subset of the sort of general multilinear maps, something that we called multilinear jigsaw puzzles in our paper. Okay. Um, and here, again, I'm talking about constructing obfuscation. So this is just in case you are worried about those attacks, which you know, we all should be thinking about them. Um, the key points here are that in this setting, no low-level encodings of 0 are given out. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that at all. There's no need for re-randomization or anything like that. And furthermore, in fact, you don't even need to sample an element. Even, you don't even need that algorithm that Sanjim mentioned. Only the master key holder, the one who generated all the Z's and everything that Sanjim was talking about, he's the only person that ever needs to encode any given element. Okay? And he has all the cards, right? He knows, he knows all the secrets. So, um, so this is straightforward. Um, and as I mentioned, this, this, is, this, this is actually critical to avoid um, uh, attacks with previous uh, 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 multilinear candidates. With CLT15, we don't need to even need to worry about this. Even without this, it seems to be everything seems to, to be okay. For now, for the next like, few weeks, at least. Yeah. For the next few weeks, yes. You know. um, uh, <clears throat> all right. So, 
Now let's uh, go into the actual construction. So I want to obfuscate a matrix branching program. Now matrix branching programs are great. When I go home and I feel like coding up some little app for myself, I usually write the app in a matrix branching program <laughs> because it is so intuitive and, and, and so, you know, so easy to use as, as a language. Um, they're great you know, I, you know, interfaces for, that, for this thing. Yeah. All right, so, so what is a matrix branching program? Um, a matrix branching program consists of 2K, and it's not a coincidence that K is related to the K we just saw moments ago, um, 2K matrices. Uh, think of K as being a large number, okay? Um, and uh, on the other hand, we also have an n-bit input. In this example, let's think of n as just being 3, so n equals 3. And I'm going to color code the input. So the first bit of the input is blue, the second bit of the input is red, the third bit of the input is green, and, and so on and so forth, okay? Now, um, if I want to evaluate such a matrix branching program on a particular input, what I'll do is multiply the matrices that are selected by those input bits, right? So if the first bit is 1, then I'll pick this matrix. If the second bit is 0, then I'll pick this matrix, and so on and so forth, okay? And a matrix branching program has a promise. The way that I'm describing it here this is the Barrington style of our matrix branching program. Um, it has a promise that whenever you evaluate it honestly in this way, then the result is always one of two different matrices. It's always either the identity matrix. In that case, we think of the function as evaluating to 0. Or it is some other fixed matrix B, which is not the identity matrix, if the output is 1. Okay? So that is what a matrix uh, branching program is. Um, and yeah, here's just an example, right? So if, if, we, if we had some specific input, let's say 1, 0, 0, then I would pick these inputs, pick these matrices, multiply them all together, and I would get either I or B, depending on what the output is. Right? And the sizing yeah. matrix is, is a complexity parameter? Uh, because of Barrington's theorem, we, it's not going to be important. Uh, yeah, even 2 by 2 is enough. But yeah, but, but, uh, uh, <coughs> um, but a constant by constant square invertible matrices that we're talking about here. So um, uh, I have a confession to make. I don't actually program in this programming language. I know it's a, it's a sad thing for you guys to hear. Um, but let me just give you uh, some sense, though, right, of how you would use a, a, a matrix branching program. So suppose I want to make a matrix branching program just for the XOR function. Okay? So I have uh, just a two-bit input, x1 and x2, and I want to XOR them. So the way to think about it is that I'll associate 0 with the identity matrix and 1 with the anti-identity matrix. Right? Um, and if you think about this, it just works. Right? In this case, again, B, which is the, uh, uh, the output for 1, um, is this anti-identity matrix. And you know, if you just make these matrices ac accordingly, Identity times identity is identity. Anti-identity times anti-identity equals identity. So that respects XOR. On the other hand, if you have an identity, then you're going to keep the other matrix, which you can respect XOR, right? So this is just one little, little tiny example of how you can uh, program in matrix branching program language. Um, in fact, there's a beautiful theorem of Barrington um, uh, that shows that all log depth uh, circuits, so any NC1 circuit, um, has a polynomial size <coughs> Excuse me, matrix branching program. Okay, so despite the fact that we're only going to be obfuscating these uh, somewhat strange-looking uh, programs, we can actually, if we're if we're successful here, we can obfuscate all log depth circuits, which will be enough for us, as Craig will tell us <laughs> tomorrow. Um, we can bootstrap once we get to NC1 to all of P slash poly, okay. to all polynomial size circuits. All right, so. Um, Let's start to make some progress. What are we going to do to build an obfuscation? So the first step um, is uh, the Killian randomization. This is from Killian's classic paper uh, from 1989, um, uh, where we do the following. We're going to pick uh, k minus 1 
completely random matrices, actually random invertible matrices over Zn. Okay. Um, just uh, think of R0 and Rk as being the identity matrix. Okay, so I'm just going to define them as, as such. And then what we do is we just take each of these matrices that came from the original matrix branching program, the one that we wanted to obfuscate, and we just randomize it by left multiplying by Ri minus 1 and right multiplying by Ri inverse. Okay? So you can see uh, immediately that because of the structure, right, we have the inverse in front and the non-inverted one behind, this does not affect the matrix product, right? The matrix product exactly is preserved here, right? So, um, so that's good. What's that? Half of identity, as I mentioned. So R0 and RK I'm defining to be identity matrix. They're, they're not random, okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so, this is the first step. We're going to apply this Killian randomization, okay? And we get all these tilded versions of our matrices, okay? And now, why do we do this? Um, again, one nice reason is because it preserves the matrix product. So it's a nice randomization, right? It has this magical property of like everything canceling out right at the last second, right? At the very last moment, the last R cancels out, and out pops the 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 uh, uh, the output. So that's nice. But it has another really beautiful property, uh, which again Killian showed, that if you restrict to a single input x, right? So again, think about only the matrices corresponding to a single input x here, right? Then you can statistically simulate the entire joint distribution of all of these matrices, knowing only the final product. Okay, so given only the final product we can actually simulate every single one of these matrices, okay? With statistically close. Okay. Um, this is actually very easy to prove. Let me just prove it to you by example, okay? So think of the cases of two, two matrices, okay? Suppose I have just M1 times R and then R inverse times M2. The general case follows in an inductive way, okay? So why can we simulate these? Just rename, okay? Remember, M0, I mean, M1 and M2, these matrices are invertible. I mentioned that at the very beginning. A matrix matching program, program only has invertible matrices. So if I just call R prime M2 inverse R, then if R was a random matrix, a random invertible matrix, then R prime is a random invertible matrix, right? I've just renamed it, nothing else. Okay. And once I have this renaming, then what is M1 R? It's just M1 M2 R prime. And what is R inverse M2? It's just R prime inverse, right? So in order to <coughs> construct these two matrices, I only need to know the product, M1, M2, right? And the same idea just works in a straightforward induction to get the, the to get Killian's result. Okay. So when you say statistically close, it's perfect. So it's, a, it's, a, it's perfect. Right. This is a, just a, yeah, it's perfect the way I described it. If the matrices are chosen, for example, uniformly at random, then there's a slight chance that they're not invertible. So they're just little things like that. But absolutely, you should think about it as perfect. Okay. Um, good. So, all right. So now we have these uh, matrices, uh, Killian randomized, right? Um, we haven't used multilinear maps yet, so let's throw that in, right? Let's take all of these matrices. And just element by element, encode them at sort of the most obvious levels, right? I can encode the first pair of matrices at level one, level two, level three, level four, like this. These are all disjoint sets. If I do matrix product, that is the classic example of a multilinear operation, right? And it yields uh, the final product at the final level where we can zero test and discover if we've got an identity matrix or not, right? So again, so far, just the most straightforward thing we could do once we have these matrices and we have multilinear maps and we want to use them, right? Okay. Um, I, right, good. So <clears throat> a first question to ask is, maybe this is already an obfuscation, right? We've done some work. Uh, we've thrown Killian and, and, uh, and multilinear maps at the problem. Maybe this has already solved it for us. Um, it turns out, no, 
there is actually exactly one, in a provable sense, key obstacle uh, remaining, which is something that we call the input mixing attack. So what is that? Um, suppose I'm an adversary, right? And I have all of these. This is my obfuscation, right? My obfuscation consists of encoded versions of these Killian randomized matrices, right? But I'm an adversary. I can do whatever I want, right? Let's say I'm a nice guy, though, mostly nice. So I pick this matrix corresponding to x1 equals 1. I multiply it by this matrix corresponding to the input 0, this matrix corresponding to the input 0. Now, if I was being honest, I have to pick this matrix, right? Because I have to continue to be faithful to the input that I've committed to so far. But I'm not an honest guy uh, when it comes to this part of the attack. Suppose that I do this instead. I just multiply by the wrong matrix, right? Nothing has prevented this so far, right? This is a completely valid thing to do. It, all, the multilinear maps allow it. Killian's randomization allows it, right? The R's are fixed for each pair of matrices, so they'll still cancel out, right? And uh, in fact, this is a real attack, and there are um, uh, examples where these kinds of input mixing attacks actually do leak critical information about a secret. Um, and in general, we do not know how to bound uh, the information that's leaked by these kinds of input mixing attacks. Actually, there's some really interesting questions there, really interesting open questions there about uh, bounding information in, 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 in this sort of a setting, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Um, this is an attack. This is a problem, right? We have to prevent this from happening. Okay. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to exploit these multilinear maps a little bit more. So <coughs> first, let me do something harmless. Ah, uh, yeah. If you had a program where each input was only read once, uh, would that sort of this already work? Or yes, yes. In that case, there's, there would be no. There are no attacks that we uh, that we would know about. Um, but yeah, there aren't really very many interesting programs like that <laughs> that only that are read once. Um, yeah. So I can use mm -hmm. that of the program evaluated on all inputs. I can, uh, right, if I, I, could, I can add the two matrices at any level. Right. Now I can multiply them together. What I get is a summation of... Uh, That's true. But if all you want is I.O., it's not an attack. And remember, I'm only talking about I.O. So I will not talk about getting VVB in this talk. I'll maybe mention it if you ask me a question later. But right now, I'm only talking about I.O., so I'm not even going to worry about, about preventing that attack because it's not an attack on I.O., right? Given the truth table of the function, you can do that yourself. Sure, but, uh, yeah. but this would be a VBB. Uh, right, and, and I'm not going to even talk about a VBB candidate uh, today. Um, although, again, I can mention the little Craig. things that have to be different. Yeah, huh? Craig will talk. No, no, no. <laughs> Craig will also not talk about that. Um, I have to define some boundaries, I guess, right around Craig. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, but uh, that's actually a good point. So, what you know, this saying is that for any functions, even functions that we are hoping to get VVB security, this will not give you VVB security because of the right. No, no, hold on. But, but as you very well know, as my co-author, this what I've said right now will not work. But we do know how to fix it, right? This and construction. this construction will not give VVB, but it will give I/O as far as we know. Okay, and that's all I was claiming so far. Okay. So what am I going to do? First, I'm going to do something just harmless. I'm going to just add a few more levels, just, just make a copy of one and call it one prime. So now my set, I'm going to abuse notation a little bit. Now it's going to consist of one through k and one prime through k prime. Okay. So far, I haven't done anything. This is just the same scheme. There's no, I'm just renaming the z's in, in, in Sanjim's language. Um, uh, but once I've done this, I can, I can use it to, to get something. So what's the, uh, what's the idea? The idea is I'm just going to take these primed indices here and just rotate them. Okay. Now, why is this a good idea? Because think about it this way. right? In order to get to the top level, I have to pick up every single index. right? One way I can do that is by picking this one, this one, and this one. Right? And that would uh, allow me to get 1, 4, and 7, and 1 prime, 4 prime, and 7 prime. Right? And I'm sorry, I think I didn't mention it. Uh, just a second, let me just go back. Uh, oh, I don't know how that happened. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I have too many animations. All right. Okay, yeah, right there. What did I do? I wanted to focus in on the matrices that corresponded to a single input, right? So I got rid of all the other matrices because that's where the problem was, right? Input mixing. If I have the matrices that correspond to the blue input, once you start at zero, I want you to continue with zero. If you start with one, then I want you to continue with one, right? That's the that's our objective. Okay. So we do this rotation, and it will end up accomplishing our objective, right? Because if I need to get to the to the final set, I can union all these, or I could union all these, but there's no other way that I can union these sets to get to the final set, right? We can kind of think of them visually as these like jigsaw puzzle pieces, right? That suppose I have these pieces, well, I can put them together to make my nice little rectangle. On the other hand, what if I have these pieces that are oriented oppositely, right? These three also I can put together. But as soon as I pick this piece, if I want to make a rectangle, I have no choice. I have to pick this one and this one. As soon as I pick this piece, I have no choice. I have to pick this one and this one. I can't combine these two sides of these jigsaw puzzle pieces. Right? So this is this notion of a straddling set that we introduced um, in the work with uh, uh, Boaz et al. Um, and it exactly solves this problem for us, right? It exactly solves the problem of input mixing attacks. Because again, now, just by the rules of multilinear maps, the adversary is just not allowed to mix these inputs together anymore. Okay. Um, so, uh, so we're almost to a place where we can take a, take a nice uh, uh, pause. So what's our obfuscation construction finally, right? We have taken our matrices. We've Killian randomized them. We've encoded them at the levels that are represented by these pieces, right? And that's it. Okay, this actually gives a plausible obfuscation construction. There are no known attacks on this, uh, uh, on, on this construction. And in fact, if we add just a tiny bit more randomness, okay, I'm just going to take each of these matrices and also add a completely independent random scalar, alpha IB, that's different for each matrix, which again doesn't change whether the final thing is going to be 0 or 1. right? So this does not affect correctness in any way. It doesn't, doesn't harm correctness in any way. Then, in fact, we can even prove that there are no algebraic attacks on this scheme. Okay? So um, let's uh, take a break now, and then when, I, when we come back, we can talk about how to actually prove, uh, uh, prove this kind of security. Right.